Hi, I'm Al Clark. Today we're going to talk about time travel. Now I know in real life there's always been moments in our lives where we wish we could have gone back in time and said, why did I say that? Or why did I run into that tree? Or whatever it is that we did, we'd like to have been able to roll back time. But um, the problem with the picture is the picture isn't really a TARDIS. At best it's a British police um, box and, and maybe you could find one of those in a museum somewhere, but you really can't buy a working TARDIS. So in today's talk, we're not really going to talk about how to go back in time because you, we can't. But what we can do is we can delay the future. And that's what this talk is really about, is, how, is what can we do in, in our lives to delay the future, and particularly with respect to digital audio and DSP. So kind of put in some context, we have been delaying the future for certain applications in the past. And since this is an audio presentation, let's talk about one or two of those. So one of them that comes to mind was actually in the way we uh, master vinyl discs. So if you think about a vinyl disc, um, you've got this disc here, and you'd like to be able to put each of these grooves close together, as close as you can, because the closer together they are, the longer your playing time. But if they're too close together, and you have, you know, someone hits a, a kettle drum, you have a problem because there's not enough room for the groove. So a trick came about, because, <clears throat> and what we did, I'm going to just erase this for a minute. I think you can remember what a, what a vinyl disc looks like. And we took a tape machine, and I'm not a particularly good artist, but here's a reel, and here's the, a, a take-up reel far away. And what, what people would do is they'd build, they'd put a record head here. So this is my record head. And they put a playback head here. This is a playback head. And if I record here and play back here, some time has elapsed. And I'd pick that amount of time on back on my LP again, so that if I was here, I could look in the, I could look half a revolution away. So essentially, I could anticipate what was going to happen half a revolution ahead, and then I could adjust the width of the cutter head to anticipate when I needed to go wide and when I didn't. And if I did that appropriately on, on music that had um, maybe mixed tracks, you know, mixed pieces where I needed more cutter head space or less, I could basically get longer playing time. And this was commonly done back when tape machines was the way we did recordings and, and the way we mastered things. Um, you know, this would have been a good tape machine and fairly, you know, fairly expensive, but it was a, a technique used and this loop might have been a little bit, you know, strung out a little bit. So something that we actually did at Danville for the same application probably a decade ago or more is a really simple idea. Um, so you, t you take your incoming stream, which today is probably digital anyway, because unlike, um, because very, very little product going into your vinyl record is actually not stored digitally in an archive format. But whether it is or not, it doesn't matter. It either goes into an A to D converter or to digital stream, and we can put it into what's called a delay line. This is a delay line. And a delay line, just basically, I get a sample, next sample, next sample, next sample, and I have in, in delays, if you will, and out the other end comes essentially identical signal to what went in. Um, and once again, now I can say, oh, you yeah, know, this is when I anticipate something, but the cutter head isn't until back here. So I have time to say, oh, I need more space or I need less space, and I can make adjustments in some way. And this is nothing more than a simple delay line. So this would be a, a really simple way you can use, you know, there's not a lot of DSP processing. Obviously, you could do more things in, in the DSP, like inverse RIAAs and, and other kinds of processing if you chose to. But this fundamental idea of delay is, is that simple. Um, in the past, we actually did some of these kind of delays. And people say, well, we've already had analog delay lines. And the answer is kind of. And it was called a bucket brigade. Bucket brigade. 
And what this was was a device that would have a bunch of capacitors inside. And you'd, you'd, you'd go through and you'd have a charge here and then charge stored here, charge stored here as it went down this little thing. And if you didn't do anything with these outputs, it's a delay line. The signal to noise was not particularly great. Uh, these were made by companies like Redicon, I think Panasonic made some, that we're talking about maybe 30 years ago. And if you actually put resistors here and summed them from these outputs, this was an actually discrete time per filter. They were called transversal filters, usually in those days. And it's not really a digital filter, because a digital filter implies quantization, in other words, turning your data into ones and zeros, basically. But a discrete time works exactly the same, and the math is actually the same. So I wouldn't really call this an analog technique, I'd call it a discrete time filter. Um, it's kind of a hybrid in today's uh, world. But it did exist, and, and people, you don't see these anymore. I don't know if anyone even makes bracket brigades anymore. I certainly haven't used one for 30 years. Um, so that's the first simple topic that's kind of the, one of the few analog things. A, a more common one than mastering vinyl is the simplest one is, say, in a, in a speaker crossover. So here's a, a very simple crossover. That's a tweeter. I realize it's not a very special one. And this represents, let's say, a woofer. And if these are lined up on the same surface, which is the most convenient case, perhaps, without staggering mechanically in some way, <coughs> if we were to look at the acoustical center, it might be about here in the tweeter and maybe about here in the woofer. And if our goal is to align these in time, we have a problem because the acoustical center of the woofer is deeper in the cabinet than the tweeter. So what we can do in a crossover, in a digital system, that's not really something we can do in an analog crossover, uh, at least not when it's constructed like this, is we can delay the uh, tweeter. And we delay the tweeter by this amount, of t by the time difference between these two sp points. However milliseconds or, or so that would be. Probably, probably uh, uh, you know, several hundred microseconds, perhaps. So we can fix that. And we do that routinely in digital crossovers. The, um, and so that's one of the simplest things that almost every cro DSP crossover that we're involved with or anyone else's almost always does time alignment of the drivers today. Uh, in the past, we would have done that by perhaps mechanical means to line up the acoustical centers. The next one I'll talk about is also for crossovers. And let's take the tweeter again, because the tweeter is the most vulnerable, typically the most vulnerable driver uh, in your system. Technically, you could do it with any of them. Uh, but if we have a tweeter here, and we want to protect it in some way, we, we might want to add a limiter. And in an analog sense, in limiter, so the idea of a limiter is something bad goes into your tweeter, and you'd like to protect the tweeter. And this is not a high fidelity moment. This is, a, gee, I hope I don't blow up my tweeter moment, perhaps, or it's going to sound awful anyway. So we're abusing the tweeter in this case, where I'm assuming we, we would, would be. If it's an analog limiter, the problem is, is that the analog limiter probably finds out that it's in trouble the same time the tweeter gets the data, which means it's a little bit late. So if anything, the, the, the limiter is kind of acting a little too early, uh, and you hear it when you don't want to hear it, because the only time you'd want to hear it was when something evil is happening. So, in a, so we build something called a look-ahead limiter, and a look-ahead limiter works in the same idea, that if I can look, if I have delay here, I can look at before the, the event happens and say, oh, hey, you know, in a few milliseconds we have a problem. And if we're going to have a problem, I'm going to do something about it and protect the tweeter by, you know, you know, shaping it different, cutting the level, whatever I'm going to do. But effectively, I'm going to limit this thing, and the tweeter uh, hasn't been exposed to the bad signal. Furthermore, since I can look ahead, you're never going to hear the limiter work unless something bad is happening. So under normal audio, it's completely invisible. And that's, that's a really important thing because the analog limiters are not going to achieve that. Now, of course, if I've delayed this, in a look-ahead limiter, I need to compensate for the other drivers with the same amount of delay. So how much delay is that? Well, 
maybe it's three milliseconds. What's three milliseconds? It's three feet in time. So three, feet, three millisecond latency is not a particularly big problem. When you have a conversation with the person across the room, you've got maybe, well, social distancing and COVID, you have six milliseconds at a minimum between the person talking to you and yourself. So we don't really consider three milliseconds a showstopper. So that's a really common thing in most crossovers. We'll implement that as a commercial portion of the crossover. Now the last one is actually one of the more esoteric ones and, and it's actually a pretty interesting one that I'll talk about today. And this has to do with uh, a little smaller technical, but when we look at an analog filter or an IAR filter particularly, we, every filter ha will have what's called an impulse response. And if I put an impulse in, which is basically a pulse here, what I get coming out of it is going to look something like this. And it's going, to, it's going to have this big peak and it's going to decay. If we treat this as a thought exercise, that decay goes on forever at lower and lower levels. Now, without getting into quantum issues and molecules of air and all this sort of thing, it does go on for a while. Let's call it that. And, 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 and so we don't have to do it necessarily as a thought exercise and say, well, that's fine. How do we get rid of it? Well... If this goes on forever, to get rid of it, we'd have to start at the beginning of time. Now, it doesn't really go on forever, but it goes on long enough. So if we can go back in time by this distance, roughly, once again, using a delay function, which in this case is part of a finite impulse response filter, a FIR, then once again, because we can delay the future, we can construct what would be what's you know kind of an anti impulse correction. And we can't do this in analog form because of something that signal processing people call uh, causality or causal. What causal really means is it's illegal to do in our universe. You know, we don't have tachyons and these kind of things. So I can't do this in a classic analog method of fixing this because it's not a causal filter. But I can do something that's a very good approximation of this using a fur filter by knowing, because this is a mathematical relationship, I can build the anti version of it at the cost of laying the future by maybe three or four milliseconds. And once again, if I do that, I, I compensate the time and anywhere else too. And this has become a uh, number of companies are doing uh, products to address this kind of idea. Uh, and you can implement this in a DSP crossover. And like I said, there are people doing it in, in uh, music servers and other ways. So this is another kind of interesting idea that is being explored uh, by more and more people and building crossovers. Um, so that's kind of what my wrap for today. Uh, and I just wanted to share a little bit of, of, of just thinking a little bit different than one way that, that DSP and digital filters and, and digital audio adds a new element or a new degree of freedom in, in terms of solving problems that were just not very practical, if at all, uh, in the analog world. Thank you.